and we're live. Welcome to a, another episode of No Man's Land. I am joined this evening by Mr. Leftovers. Go ahead and say hi to everybody, Dark. Hello, hello. We're going to be spending some time tonight uh, talking about delegation and taking initiative. Uh, so for those of you that may be new to this, we'll just kind of give the quick 30 second, what in the world is this? This is kind of a series that we've uh, started a few uh, few weeks back, kind of talking about leadership principles, kind of very, very basic leadership principles and applying them in a foxhole context, in a gaming context. But really our main focus is to be better as people. Because uh, it just so happens that if you improve yourself uh, in general, you can improve yourself as a leader in game, as a player in game. Uh, you can improve yourself as a professional in life. You can improve the quality of your relationships and the way that you interact with people. All the principles that we talk about are very transferable to a lot of different areas. And so we felt this is something pretty unique to offer, especially in the context of you know, a foxhole environment and focusing on those things. And so that's kind of the quick elevator pitch for what, what the vision is behind this, what we are intending to do, and what we plan to do. Uh, and we're going to be continuing that by spending our time today talking about delegation and taking initiative. So I'm going to just dive right into it. We're looking at kind of what we want to do today is we're going to be looking at the two separate ideas of delegation and initiative. Uh, I do look at these. I like to talk about these at the same time because I do think that they do build on either one another quite well. And so we'll be defining both our terms. We will be reviewing opportunities for good delegation. We'll be talking about the importance of good orders. That'll make more sense when we get there. And then, of course, reviewing some examples of, again, good initiative at work and poor initiative at work. And so getting right into it, what is delegation? Uh, delegation in this, in, like in the most, I guess the textbook form is the transfer of responsibility and authority of a task. Um, where people go wrong with this is just, it, it is not really understanding how to, like what it is and what it isn't, right? So, you know, the tasks that you delegate should ultimately, ultimately be designed to use or build the strengths of that team member, right? Whoever you're using, it should be designed and catered to their development and growth just as much as it is getting the job done. And I think that some of that will get evident as we dive in, but it is definitely not the transfer of menial tasks that are not related to the job at hand or the task at hand. Uh, you know, it, it is not delegation to ask somebody to get you a cup of coffee. That is laziness, right? Uh, it, it is, is there, and there's so many poor examples of delegation that we'll get into in a minute here. Uh, you know, it's not asking somebody to do their role as the, as they understand it, right? If it's somebody's job to do that and you're asking them to do that, that's not delegation. That's just them doing their job. Uh, and then it's certainly not getting rid of what you don't like or enjoy. Again, back to this idea of building on the strengths of the team member or even complementing your own weaknesses, just simply avoiding your responsibilities that are boring or annoying is not good delegation technique. Um, and so that's kind of the bullet point. That, that this is going to become a lot more obvious when we start to get into some of these examples, and I hope it will kind of come to life here. Uh, but Dark, any thoughts before we continue here? No, nothing right now at the start. Just, uh, just ready for the ride right now. All right, sounds good. So let's break this down for a second. As we talk about delegation, we need to first consider what can be delegated. And I'm going to break this down in the context of a infantry squad leader because that's the context that I enjoy the most. It's the context I'm most familiar with, and I think it's very useful for us to explore this. And some of these tasks will maneuver into other areas of supervision as well, be it other battalions. Or again, real life, if you want to go ahead and use that professional context. Uh, but looking at some of these common squads that a squad, like, a, and I'm using the example of a DK squad leader because I, I know that some people in here are, are in DK. And I know some people that watch this are not. And so to very briefly explain, our infantry sections in DK are divided into three different infantry sections with different command structures that have to coordinate and communicate with one another. Needless to say, that communication uh, system is more complex than you might expect at first glance. Those squad leaders are communicating both in TeamSpeak and in Discord, and sometimes using even in-game comms as well. That's a lot of different channels of communication to manage. Therefore, it is a task and responsibility there's for them to maintain communication with the other squads in DK, and ultimately communications with the overall command structure that we have in place during an operation. It's a lot of responsibility. Uh, the other thing that a squad leader has to do, arguably the most important, is keeping members in the team engaged, enthusiastic, and on task, right? Making sure that, that what they're doing is working toward the overall operational goal. You've got opportunities to scan the environment for, uh, for opportunities. So one of the things that I see happen a lot with squad leaders that get overwhelmed is they get a little tunnel vision. And as a result of that tunnel vision, they miss the broader context of the battlefield and they lose 
sight of additional opportunities for success. And so you're busting your head against the wall where if you would just step back and detach from that front line for a second, it's like, oh, I don't think I need to hit this wall after all. Maybe if I just move 10 meters to the west, this wouldn't be nearly as difficult as I'm making it. And so that overall situational awareness is critical for a squad leader. Leading direct action attacks and defensive sweeps. So that's, again, putting yourself right there. You're you know engaging the enemy. You're helping your squad engage the enemy. You're maybe directing fields of fire, directing players into specific locations in the battlefield. The, the, I guess maybe the micromanagement aspects of leading a squad come into play. Uh, the, directing the use of those complex equipment resources and even construction. So uh, it's kind of taking a step, you know, 10, 15, 20 meters away from that front line. Maybe you need to be responsible for building vision, constructing fighting positions. Uh, that's something that you as a squad leader should be aware of and, and should be thinking about. Uh, and then of course, Foxhole, you've got a gun. You might need to shoot it on occasion. That takes time. That takes mental attention away from your other responsibilities. And then last but not least, you got opportunities to recognize and coach team members as well. And so you look at all these things, and this is a huge palette. And this is not comprehensive. This is just a f the immediate ones that came to mind. But this is a huge body of responsibilities for a squad leader in the infantry to really have to think about and manage. And I would put forward the argument that if you try to take all these on your own shoulders, you're going to fail at some of these. Or they're at least not going to be done as well as they could be. And so the main thing that you can begin thinking about then, when you're looking at delegation and you're trying to establish delegation, you, you want to find the key things or the key tasks that you're responsible for that determine success and failure, right? The big ones. And, you know, if you have the time, do the moderate and even low, uh, low priority stuff. Kind of get those on the table. And then when you have that understanding, you can start asking questions. Okay, what about, what are these, what of these tasks can I then consider delegating? What opportunities do I have to delegate this to other members of the squad, be they other junior leaders, aspiring leaders, other leaders that you have in your command structure, or even guys that aren't leaders. Maybe you've got guys that have potential to be a leader with a little bit more growth, a little bit of experience, and you can delegate some of these tasks to them. You know, these are all, these are opportunities for a whole host of people that will become evident if you start opening your mind and thinking about this very purposefully. I'll take a breath here, Dark, real quick. Uh, we're going to move into some direct examples of this in a minute, but any, any thoughts on this, I, I guess, this list of tasks here? And I'd love to hear your thought even from like an already perspective, you know, if this is kind of transferable to that space. Oh, yeah, definitely a lot of stuff can be uh, like this, this is pretty much the oh, sorry, it's a lot. It's a lot of process, but pretty much we go through the same thing in artillery as well, especially when we go into the realm of uh, having different spotters, especially in, in here in DK, you know. We have a, I would like to say, a moderate size artillery squad. But um, a lot of the times is, you know, if you have more than one spotter in a, in a, in the same channel, you know, you can have some real big issues, especially with communications and whatnot. People get confused, coordinates get thrown in the air. Everyone's like, what's going on? So one thing to to do is, especially to help aspiring, you know, leaders and spotters, is to at least let them have their own room to breathe and you know give them certain tasks with certain equipment and it, it's not just a i don't want to do it i'm gonna let them do it it's more so of setting them for success and giving them you know tasks and challenges you know they can if they do if, if they're willing to either risk or uh take chances you know they can overcome an obstacle rather than just i don't want to do it so i'll let them do it it's like that's that's not that's not proper delegation that's just being lazy yeah and it's also kind of, it comes back to the traditional definition of humility that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? This is knowing your limitations, understanding what your limitations are as a single individual on the battlefield. Uh, and, you know, because you, know, you may be a god tier spotter, but I mean, I got to believe that doing coordinates for two different guns that are geographically separate from each other is is tough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't oh, yeah. imagine. Like, it, it, it would certainly be more efficient to delegate spotting to somebody else, at least in my mind. But I think that, you know, there are some God tier people that can try to pull that stunt. But even them, uh, they'd probably be less efficient than, you know, delegating at least a portion of that responsibility. So let's talk for a minute about bad, bad delegation, right? Straight, straight out the gate here. Um, bad delegation is understanding what is bad delegation is as i've kind of alluded to significantly influenced by both your capabilities and that of your team right and so just to kind of give a kind of a, a very specific example here uh we don't require mandatory action reports in dk i'm just using this because it's, it's it's a good one to think about but if if we did if you had to do an action after action report 
delegate an after action report when you have the most knowledge of the situation is bad delegation, right? If you had the most, if you are the right person who has the information required to do the task, then you should probably do that task. You shouldn't settle for lower performance for the sake of delegating that to somebody else. Uh, at the same time, failing to delegate to somebody when they have the most knowledge is also poor delegation because that's a surprise, uh, like that's a prime opportunity when you let your uh, pride get in the way or whatever. I've, I've seen weird stuff like that happen, again, more in the business world where there are certain leaders that want to be in the spotlight all the time and they've got you know team members that have put a lot of work on a project and they're the subject matter experts, yet that leader comes in and does all the presentation of that work and that material because they like to speak or they you know they, they enjoy getting up in front of people and talking or, or, or whatever the reason but that that was an opportunity a great opportunity to delegate to somebody in their team and give them that opportunity to demonstrate their work because they know the most knowledge about it and to grow in their abilities as a presenter and you just kind of took that from them that's a that, that's a missed opportunity for delegation right uh, and, and you could apply that to a whole bunch of different other things that where the situation changes dramatically. What is good delegation technique for one squad leader may be poor delegation technique for another. And I'll give a, you know, a great example for me. I am not a strong artillery strutter, spotter by any stretch of the imagination. I, I'm, I'm generally speaking slower than average at it. Uh, I don't have confidence in the space. And as a result of that, I have some guys in uh, in my squad, namely Clock is the first one that comes to mind. Vaninsky is another one that comes to mind. But those two guys are excellent with artillery. Absolutely excellent. They're great spotters. They're great in the space. They're very comfortable in the space. And so whenever possible, I delegate artillery-related tasks to those two guys. Even though as a squad leader, that is my responsibility to oversee that process and make sure it happens, uh, I delegate to their strengths to mitigate my weaknesses. Not for the sake of laziness, but because we want to win, we're playing to win, and it's better for the team if those guys are doing that kind of work than it is if I'm doing it. Uh, and in a different squad, that would be absolutely ridiculous. Again, in our, you, in, in, if Dark was at play, if we need artillery, you want Dark spotting. You want Dark coordinating those resources because Dark is one of the best in this game at managing artillery. And so him delegating that responsibility, unless he's really busy with something critical, is probably not a good space for him to delegate. Uh, unless, of course, he's got a bigger objective of trying to grow people's competency in that space, right? And even then, that situation then creates an environment where that delegation might be better than it would appear on the surface. And so this is kind of a difficult subject to, to talk about because the space changes a little bit depending on your strengths and weaknesses and the strengths and weaknesses on your team. It's understanding those things, again, having enough humility to realize where you're strong and where you're weak and where your team and having a very accurate assessment of your team's abilities can, can really make a big difference. Already talked about this a little bit before, but frankly, laziness, right? Delegating discipline because you don't want to. Uh, I've seen this happen before, not really in, in DK as much uh, or in, in, even in gaming worlds, but definitely professionally. I've seen leaders that have you know junior leaders underneath them that delegate disciplinary conversations or hard conversations to other people because they don't want the intensity of that conversation. That's bad leadership. That's laziness. Uh, it, it, that's definitely not good. Asking someone to pull your kit for you because you are too busy. This is kind of a silly one, but I, you know, I almost imagine a world where you, you know, you 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 contrive some reason for somebody to have to go do your work for you, and you're making that person more inefficient for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and so, so don't be lazy. Don't don't have people do stuff for you. Don't have people get your coffee. You know that that kind of stuff's not delegation. That's laziness. Uh, micromanagement. I like look at this one a little bit because this one's, again, kind of hard to define at times, but I do find that bad delegation very frequently involves micromanagement as well. So you become overly specific with your assignment, and that's not delegating, that's that's micromanaging. So sit in this foxhole and don't move until I tell you removes all initiative from that person to be able to act and react in that battle space. A better solution would be, hey, I need you to keep your eyes on this flank and update me on how this is going and maneuver to the best of your ability. But I don't want to see Colonials attack us on this side without me knowing about it, right? That's delegating that angle of fire to a team member. And then they've got, you know, a whole variety of options that they can explore to resolve that situation. Maybe they do choose to sit in that foxhole. Maybe they choose to build some vision to extend our vision that direction so that you don't have to have a man sit in that foxhole full time and we can react to that with enough uh, with enough lead time, you know, there's a number of things that they can do to innovate from there. If you assign, you know, a strategic objective instead of a specific task, uh, you know, this one right here, I want you to recognize clock for a job well done. Okay. You, you've yet again, 
micromanaged that situation. You haven't said, hey, listen, I want you to kind of keep an eye on the guys today and look for opportunities to really recognize good work uh, and, and to find opportunities to coach people as well. Can you keep an eye on that today and really make that a focus? Instead, you've done that for them and just said, hey, listen, I want you to do this very specific element of this. Again, that's not delegation. That's 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 laziness. You, you've made the observation that clock deserves to be recognized. Do it yourself. Uh, don't don't push that off on somebody else for, for, for some delusion of delegation. That's not delegation. Uh, Dark, any thoughts on bad delegation? Anything that you've seen that kind of comes to mind as well in this space that you'd like to talk about? It's very common to do that when you're in a position of leadership to get the misconception of I'm the leader of the squad, you do what I say. And a lot of a lot of the times inexperienced young leaders just think of I you know, I'm in the position of power. I can just boss people around to do the stuff I don't want. And just like we said earlier, it's not like this is not the case. This is not how you be a good leader. Like you're you're being more of a of a boss, yes, but that's not what we need you to be because to further you know, grow yourself as a leader, you need to learn how to do delegation. And the best way to to you know be good at it is to learn and understand what are the bad parts. And don't let laziness be an excuse and don't let micromanaging and perfection hold you, you know, like like prevent you from doing things that need to be done, you know. I think what what, what he just said earlier with uh, micromanagement, you know, I sit in this foxhole and don't move until I tell you. That's a very like you're being you're being too strict and to the point and you're not leaving room for any innovation just like you know Kaz just said and having a more better approach with you know giving that extra breathing room can breed uh, brood a lot of results and especially it grows that person you are delegating that task to as well they get to you know add more tools to their belt and maybe they can learn something from this whole situation as a whole. And that's how you grow future leaders as well, is by showing, you know, good delegation. Because it's, it's a very, very important task to have as a squad leader, you know. Let me kind of emphasize this point on why this sit in this foxhole and don't move until I tell you is, is bad. And, and it kind of explain it. Because what happens is you're missing the bigger picture. Because as I said, there, there is a system of kind of opportunity costs with anything that you do with your time. Um, and as a result of that opportunity cost, you taking the time to isolate the specific tactic and micromanage this resource means that there are other things you're not doing in exchange for that level of micromanagement. And chances are what you've exchanged it for is not good. I mean, you could be doing something better with your time. And at the same time, you've cheated that individual of all manner of self-improvement and, and again, innovation, as, as Dark mentioned. Uh, and so, you know, if I could put it this way, if you're a squad leader and you're trying to manage 10 guys, if you're going to really micromanage every one of those guys, you're not going to be successful. You might get a few of those pieces in place, but there are going to be other pieces that are left without leadership because you're taking too much time on a smaller portion of your resources. And so if you were to say delegate a fire team out, say, okay, you know, fancy, I need you to take this, uh, take these three guys and do this objective. I need you to take these three guys and guard this area. I need you to take these three guys and guard this artillery piece even, right? Then you've delegated it. It's up to fancy then to determine with his lower span of control, how to use those resources. And so again, in that case, if Fancy's got himself and two other riflemen, he may indeed micromanage in that situation a little bit more. Because he's only got two guys under his command. He can very closely monitor what they're doing and make sure that if there is a precision required, he then has the space to do that. He might be able to say, hey, sit in this foxhole and hold this angle right now. And say the other guy, okay, I need you to sit over here and hold this angle. I'm going to sit in the middle here and watch the watchtower coverage and report to you guys so that we can pivot here. That, that's a fire team working in a very tight, concerted environment where, you know, the, the tactics can be refined very carefully because there's not a large span of control. Uh, and so just, I would keep in mind that, that idea of span of control, and that's not something we've really talked about here yet. That may be something that we, that we need to explore a little bit later to really explain, but I will briefly introduce this to say, that the level of span of control that you have determines the level of involvement you can have with your team. And depending on the task assigned, determines what is the most ideal span of control. Uh, and so there are certain tasks that require a very small span of control because the level of micromanagement required is intense to get it done, to get the coordination right. You need to talk a lot. You need to communicate a lot. You need to give a lot of instruction and direction. I'd argue that Artie's a decent example of a squad that needs a pretty low span of control because there's a, the flow of communication is pretty constant and the precision has to be right. 
a rifle team has immediate, uh, uh, depending on how you manage it, has a moderate to high span of control. Uh, because you can give general direction to a group of 10 guys, and they can follow that general direction quite well. Uh, and so you can get away with that. But if you have a rifle team with more than 15 guys in it, then your span of control gets, starts to get a little bit overextended, and your ability to manage all those resources starts to fall off pretty dramatically. And I don't know, so I don't know if any of you have been in DK, especially those of you that have been in DK for a while, have been in a channel where there's been an infantry squad that's gotten a little bit bigger than it should, with like 20 to 25 guys in it. I've been in those channels. And what, what happens is a few people dominate the conversation and other people that might contribute to that, either through call-outs or observations, just go quiet. And so the, the people that are talking, commanding, get the delusion that this is working well, but the rest of the squad is feeling a little suffocated because there's too much, there's too much going on and there's not enough ability for them to really interact and engage in that environment because there's just too many people and there's too much information flying around and as a result that would have that squad or that unit would be performing a lot better if instead of having 20 25 guys they had 10 to 15 guys in two different channels with two people overseeing those responsibilities and those leaders communicating with each other on how things are going that environment's a lot more comfortable for the rifle team members to perform and operate in and so that's a little a, a significant expansion on kind of why this is in here for that reason can i add just one more yeah, thing on please. badget so, and this ties in to a lot of things, of course, and I, we, we, we say it almost in every single Under the Helmet, is ego plays a good part in delegation. Because you could get into your head, I don't need to be doing that. I can get someone else to do it. And that's a big, big no-no. When you got to realize, like, no one is above one another, you know? Like, you're not too busy to pull your own kit. You get what I mean? It's like, yeah. In the same breath, I will pause in the same breath though, because there are certain situations where, for example, say at this current spot, you're looking for something and you're spotting, and unfortunately you you died and someone else just spawned in your squad and you you know asked for that that order, right? But generally, you don't just want to have like do this because I'm lazy, but I'm gonna right. give a bullshit reason like uh -huh. that's a big ego thing you gotta like tweak down amongst yourself and it, and, it, and it's something that i've seen in foxhole a lot of people do especially some known individuals that just you know command a bunch of you know unfortunately randoms to do pretty much something they don't want to do and you know it's kind of like logistics in a way you get, you get what i'm saying when mm -hmm. yep. some person manages to rally up someone and to just you know hey we need shirts and they get the people to you know unfortunately do something or, probably bad example Probably a bad example. It's not the but. worst though. I mean, it's not good leadership. Uh, you know, they've they have they've influenced people to do a task for them, but they've and so to the extent of managing that individual, they've managed that individual, but they've not really led that individual to the extent that 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 person is going to be better for their leadership, that they're going to get uh, follow through in the future, even that that person's likely to follow them to do future things. You've you've spent some capital, if you will, to put that person in a bad position. So yeah, you've managed, but you've not led, and those two things are quite different. I think we're good for the next slide. Absolutely. So let's talk about good delegation. We talked a lot about some of the bad ways to do this. Let's talk a little bit about some of these opportunities. So we remember before we had mentioned some of the tasks that are common to an infantry squad. Those things are ripe for delegation if they're delegated properly. So at the end of the day, you can make somebody responsible for managing and relaying communication. Again, if we have a complex communication framework, it, it can be good have one person focused on that part of the operation. They can still participate and do the directing fire engagements and, and, and manage and do other things, but having one person help with that, we have found that to be extremely effective in DK. Instead of having all of our squad leaders, all of our officers in a single communication channel, we have certain key people who are really focused on making sure that coordination and communication goes back and forth between other elements. And because they have a focus in that, and because they've been delegated that and given enough space to focus on that, the communication is improved because uh, they're not bottled down or they're not held down by other responsibilities. And I know firsthand how much easier it is as a squad leader if I'm the squad leader responsible for the forward elements, having another member of the squad that's in TeamSpeak 
listening to the communications from other squads and giving communication of what we're doing to other squads, that frees up my mind so much and my ability to do other things by having somebody do that and vice versa. If I'm doing this communication and I've got somebody else leading the direct elements of the squad, it's so much easier for me to focus on making sure that I've got the other team informed, that uh, I'm listening carefully to what they're sharing and then finding that opportunity to give it back to my primary fire team leader when he's got a second to hear it and be able to deal with it. I mean, that that helps so much. And so that's a, it's a really great opportunity. Uh, you want to, as I mentioned before, delegate according to your team strength and weaknesses to so find out where it is. I know for a fact that in my, in my, in my leadership structure in Reductus, that fly is not a great radio operator. <laughs> okay. You know, if I, if I've got fly in my squad, I generally speaking, don't rely on him for communications because it's not something that he excels in personally. And he's, and he'll be the first to tell you that he doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like he's got a good rhythm with it. And he, and he, and he really feels like it's not his strength. So, I could try to fight through that. I could try to force him into it to make him get better or get better, get better. Or I could manage around that weakness and put fly where he is good uh, and have him do things that are according to his strengths and not according to his weaknesses. Uh, and so keep, keep that in mind. At the end of the day, you want to give people responsibility to lead subtasks of the bigger picture. And so you got, you got your rifle team of, uh, of 10 people. Break that squad down into a three-man mortar team. I need you to lead this water team, and I need you to prioritize anti-tank defenses. Boom. You take those three guys. You move them off to a different channel. You stay in, Maybe you get in a uh, team speak with them so you can maintain some loose communications. And there you go. You've split off the, uh, you know, 30% of your team to a different channel, and you're no longer monitoring that. You don't have to worry about what they're doing. You know what they're doing, and he's going to keep you informed on his progress. And better yet, not only do you know what he's doing, that guy now has responsibility of himself and two other people, and he has the freedom to innovate with that to figure out how he's going to stay. I said prioritize anti-tank defenses. That doesn't mean he doesn't have the freedom to engage other opportunities or other targets of opportunity. That guy can scout the front and see that we've got a uh, a rifle garrison or, or even a foxhole that's given us some trouble. That's in a, t a sketchy spot. He can put, put that down for us. I don't need to tell him to do that because he's got the authority to do that. I've delegated the responsibility. I don't have to tell him, hey, listen, I need you to bring down this foxhole for me. I, I know that he's got enough awareness. If, if we've done it right, he's got enough awareness. He's got enough initiative to be able to see those opportunities, and act on his own. I need you to be a spotter for our squad. Squad, Scan for threats as we maneuver and advise us of opportunities. Again, this is something that I really want to highly recommend to any infantry leaders is that you divide the task of who's leading the squad in direct combat and who's spotting for the squad because those two responsibilities are quite different. I see a lot of rifle team leaders take their whole squad of 10 guys, they've got the binoculars, and they're at the center of the squad, and everybody's on them as the primary uh, line of battle. And so what happens is that guy is scouting with binos and the whole squad's pausing every time he has to stop and scout. And then he leads that direct action conflict and in all probability he's going to die in that direct action. He's got a 50% chance of dying if not higher. And then the squad has lost their spotter and the remaining squad members that survived have no direction, no leadership, have nobody that's got their head off the battlefield to be able to assess what's going on. I want to give a huge shout out to Fancy in this space because Fancy did has done an excellent job when he's had full command of the reduction section of breaking the team down in such a way where he kind of serves as spotter and he makes a whole bunch of other direct rifle team elements where those guys have a lot of authority for the way they maneuver and behave. And he looks at the whole picture and gives them intel. He gives them advice in some cases, but he doesn't even necessarily tell them what to do. He just lets them know what's going on. He's spotting for them. And with the information that he's feeding them, they're making tactical decisions on the ground with the rifle teams that they've got. And so, you know, in, in, in the reductive squad, one of the things that I, I like about it is that we, I think, do an exceptional job of breaking down into smaller elements that are very autonomous and very independent. And we can do a lot of different things at the same time because we have a decentralized command like that. Now, on the flip side, that comes at a cost. Sometimes when we decentralize too far, it can take a little bit more time to bring everybody back together. So when you need like a huge blob of 10 infantry to hit something, if you've decentralized too far, there's the consequence of, well... Now it's, it's tougher for me to get a bigger hammer to bear on a hard target. And that's where something like Scar somewhere, a group like Scarus can excel. Scarus is excellent at bringing the hammer to a hard target. And I love those guys and I love the enthusiasm they bring, but they, they have no problem running into machine gun fire and getting it done. But they do, but they do a very effective job of regrouping and getting, getting into it very, very quickly. Um, the rest of these I've just kind of mentioned, except for the last one, just even in that, that small dissertation. But I need you to be quartermaster our FOB, anticipate our equipment needs, and let logistics know in advance of our supply needs. Again, that's a task that can be overwhelming when you're trying to do all these other things. But if you have one guy in the squad that every time he respawns, he just takes a quick look at the FOB and gives it a sanity check, 
that's a nice thing to decentralize real quick. And then he can let other people know, hey, listen, we're down to 50 shirts here. Or, hey, listen, we're lo running low on stickies and we've seen some half tracks in the field. Or we're expecting half tracks in the field. You know what I mean? But like scouting that kind of information uh, is really, really good to have somebody to have their eyes on. And it can be very difficult when you're trying to keep track of where everybody is, get commands, get orders and team speak. If you're overextended, you're not going to be able to keep up with all this. You're just not going to be able to. So find opportunities to delegate these things that are overextending your focus so that you can do a good job in the things that you keep in your head. And there's no limit to the way that you can divide this out. That's the beauty of it is you divide things out according to your strengths and your weaknesses and the strengths and the weaknesses of the people you're working with. Uh, find those chances and use those people in the right way. I'm going to take a drink of water real quick, Dirk. <laughs> I'll just add in with um, with regarding, you know, good delegation is you got to avoid having a single target order, you know, like using I using this as, a, as an example because it's a really good one. Is I need you to lead this mortar team, prioritize anti-tank defenses. Prioritize is the key for this, like, you know, for this order. Instead of just I need you to lead this mortar team, take out all the anti-tank defenses. That is too much of a single, like single focus order that you don't leave any room for, you know, uh, any initiative, you know, it's, just, it's, 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 it's interesting that just one word, you know, really could just change that whole order in a sense too, because I think in generalize, you don't want to just have everything down to a nit nitpick point you want to grow that person and that's just the main thing of like delegation is you pretty much want to challenge and grow that person and use them either on their bests or even you want to try to help them out on their worst but one thing you got to learn to avoid is don't give people single digit or single like single orders because that's not you're just you're at that point you're setting them up to fail or you're not using them as efficiently as you can because let's say if they did see like you know like that there there's a howitzer being constructed but you know like, hey but we're only tasked to deal with anti-tank stuff so sorry I, I'll, I'll let them know but you know instead of letting them have that take their own initiative because just the simple word of prioritize any anti-tank defenses doesn't stop them from hey you know what I'm going I can I can get the shot I'm going to take it and it's just that field of of you know giving these type of orders is really really uh important especially in a squad leader setting I don't want to continue to give too many shout outs to fancy but you know th that exact situation or very similar situation happened a few ops ago where we had uh, reductus on assignment for providing indirect fire support so the whole squad was dedicated to indirect fire support with mortars and just they're maneuvering around the battlefield taking out targets of opportunity and we just gave him that much freedom we almost gave him too much freedom frankly just said you guys are providing indirect fire support for the operation weave yourself into where you find it and that probably was a little overly broad but they found out you know in their scouting they identified the enemy fa and they, you know, on their own initiative, they had scouted a flank angle that would take them behind the FA. And they, you know, the way they communicated it was absolutely beautiful. It's like, guys, we found a path to take out the FA. We're going to be off the front for about 10 minutes to go on this flank because it's going to take us a little while to mobilize. You know, we're going to have to go, become uh, mechanized and get around them. And uh, we think we can snipe this FA. And so they did. And with that communication, our armor knew that they had lost their direct fire support on the front line. The infantry knew that, you know, a significant element of the infantry sections had pulled off on a different angle. But... As the Legion command, we didn't tell them to do that. Like, they, they saw it. They acted. That's awesome. That's what you're looking for. Uh, you you want to empower people to find those things and, and use their strengths because they've got a better sense of what's going on in the front than you do most more commonly than not. And it's a rule, and, and I remember that situation. I'm, I'm hoping I gained the same one because I, pre, I was spotting for artillery there. Yeah. Good, good delegation like that. Like in a weird sense, it gives it gives other people room to breathe as well. Like just for example, you as infantry squad assign someone to do mortars, while that frees up my time as artillery to focus on bigger and better things. You know, on the more high priority targets. You know, instead of uh, it's so my, my my words always can jumble on this. The 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 brain levels and brain powers are very like I'm at a good IQ of like 15 and you're already like surpassing 200. <laughs> no, but, but, but you're right though. You've, you've get breathing room knowing that that element of 
something that could be in your responsibility has been delegated and taken care of, right? You, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And it gives you freedom to breathe. Because again, in the artillery tool toolkit, you've got to keep in mind that you could be assigned to mortars to provide direct action support. And if somebody else has taken that, that's one less thing that you have to worry about. And you have more space to focus on other things that you're doing. And so you got you have to kind of assess what's in your uh, what's in your responsibility toolkit and where you can shave off some of those pressure points. And, and this is one that's going to be a little uh, controversial, but I'll put it out there anyway when class listens to this later. But I am very, very poor with like Global HQ supply orders and supply monitoring. I'm not good at it. It takes me a lot of time. It divides my focus from the front, and I'm very passionate that I cannot do it well. And so, the and, and Klaus disagrees with me on that. We we have a little bit of conflict on. He says, "No, you can't do it. It's your responsibility. If you don't want, if you don't order supplies, you can fight with pistols." You know what I mean? Like, and so we've had we've had a little bit of conversation about that. That's been good. It's been healthy. Uh, but we, where we've settled, and I'm grateful for the for their willingness to kind of work with me. But a lot of lodge, you guys are very very patient with me, and uh, have been very good about even inserting themselves in the Legion Command channel, and they prompt me for that information and kind of effectively delegated themselves to help with that in a, in a, in a way that was just that was, that was just really awesome managing around my weaknesses because there are other LCs that don't struggle with it as much as I do. I know that for a fact that I'm probably the worst of the group uh, that what that when we're commanding an operation, I'm really bad at supply management. I just know it. I don't I don't it just doesn't come top of mind. Uh, and, and it helps to have somebody taking care of that. Can I chime in something with that? Yeah, just, go ahead. Just as of a recommendation because this is what I normally do because I'm, I'm fairly familiar. And I love, you know, uh, global hq but one thing i also did and i'm glad that you know i i gotta give some love to, to solar and and um, retro you know th they they handle with supply management for artillery too and so most of the time they even do it without you know they just hear me babble like oh we need more we need more artillery shells and then bam they make a simple order and one thing i would probably say maybe you could delegate someone you know like like for example this that's a big it's a big weakness for you because that's something you can't really, really focus on. But maybe you can delegate this task to, you know, one of your other junior officers to mm -hmm. just, you know, just work, focus on, you know, global. Hey, like, hey, uh, Kaz, what do we, what do we need? So, okay, well, some HEs and more SMG ammo. Just, just off the bat would be nice. And then, bam, they can make the request for yep. you. Yep. And, and it's yeah. just, you know. And I know people look out for me like that. And it's, I'm, I'm so grateful for all those people that have very silently in the background looked out for my stupidities uh, and, and covered down on that. Uh, it, it just, it's just huge for me. And that's a very specific example. So moving right along, let's go ahead and talk about initiative then. We beat around the bush with it a little bit. We've already mentioned initiative a few times, but let's talk about it. What is initiative? Initiative is the power or opportunity to act or take charge before others do. You think about that in the context of delegation, as we've already talked about, and what you do when you delegate is you're giving people, you know, a mission, so to speak, and enough space to take initiative within that and 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 win and fight and compete. Whereas if people don't have the ability to take initiative and they are too restrained, they're going to perform poorly in bad situations. If you have an armor column that is very, very disciplined and they are told that, and they don't move unless you tell them to move, well, you've taken all initiative from those guys instead there should be certain paradigms, there should be certain liberties in play where those team members in that mechanized squad know that they need to act without instruction because the situation requires that level of initiative for survival. And so it should be automatic that when a colonial tank line comes through the darkness on the flank, what should you do? Everybody should be on the page. Do you turn and engage? Do you reverse and pit? like? What is it? But that the, the team should have the initiative to make those calls and should not have to wait on a single person to give that order. That's a dangerous situation. Uh, at the same time, if you're managing multiple tanks and people make the take the initiative in different ways, you can get a disjointed response. And so it's that's also dangerous. And so you have to again, if you've delegated properly and people have been trained properly, they they will take initiative in the right way and respond properly to those kind of threats. And so at the end of the day, with initiative, you want to make sure people ultimately understand their mission, whatever that mission happens to be. We'll talk about missions in a minute. You want to understand the opportunity cost, that I've already talked about before, of decisions. So when you, when you give a mission or you give instructions, there is, you exchange something for that. You're exchanging time. And time is all you got as a leader. And, and, and time is a very finite resource. And how you spend your time better be creating value or at least more value than the alternative. And that's kind of weird to think about, but but time is, ex again, it's exceptionally valuable. And so you want to be careful with how you use your time and how you communicate your mission and communicating your plan. 
at the end of the day, when you are taking initiative on an action, you want to communicate what you're doing. Okay. And so we come back to that example with fancy when he flanked around to snipe that field artillery, he communicated that he didn't just disappear off the field and we had to run him down and figure out what's going on. And I think this is a place that people that do take initiative very early, they miss this part where they don't communicate what they're doing. They just take initiative. And then, then later on we found out what happened and that, and that can be, that can create disjointed problems throughout the other parts of the squad at a certain point. When you're trying to take initiative, you may need to request changes to orders because at the end of the day, you're going to get orders from time to time that are overly restrictive or even bad. And so you should be taking initiative to assess the reasonableness of your orders and assess what the situation is. And if you think you've got an opportunity to do something better, yet your orders are overly restrictive, request a change to the orders. Don't just go rogue, but you might want to request a change. So if we've been given, if we've dedicated your whole infantry section to QRF the Lodgy Road, and that Lodgy Road has been quiet for 10 or 15 minutes, Take the initiative, say, hey, listen, we've set up watchtower vision on this road. We've patrolled it for the last 10 minutes. We've seen no enemies. We think that we've got an opportunity to do some help on the front. Can we, you know, is there any reason we shouldn't come up and join you guys? Take the initiative, rest, request that change. We probably had you assign a queue off that road for a very good reason. Uh, but if the circumstances have changed over the 10 or 15 minutes and we missed it, you need to let us know that, right? Communicate at the end of the day. Remember, following a bad mission or bad order orders is ultimately your fault if you don't speak up. And so th th this is something I'm pretty uh, passionate about from the idea of owning the results of, you know, an entire operation, owning your own inputs in the operation. Uh, if you rely too much on your supervision, if you rely too much on whoever's commanding you or whoever's giving you orders and you just blindly follow those things and you think it's a bad plan or you think it's a bad idea, you think it won't work and you don't speak up about it, then you're just as responsible for that failing as the person who came up with a plan. Uh, and so you don't, you don't benefit from this high position of, well, I knew this wasn't going to work. I'm just a bunch of morons up there did this anyway. That, that's a bad attitude. And that's not going to make you successful in this game. It's certainly not going to make you successful in life. I, I could, I could spend the rest of this podcast talking about how destructive that attitude is. Uh, but I won't do that for now. So, so keep in mind, own the results of the mission, own the results of the operation and find ways to be better. And if that means questioning orders, if that means requesting a change to orders, do that. Bring it up, innovate in the space, and take initiative to do that. So, what do you do, Kaz, when uh, you, you speak up, but ultimately, uh, like, you know, they're yeah. still strong arming the situation? So, two situations, right, that can come up. You bring up the concern, and the person says, no. No, no context, no explanation, no nothing. At that point, you, I, the only hope is that you've got enough rapport that individual to understand that they probably know something you don't, they don't have the time to explain it to you, and you need to follow that order. Even if you think it's a bad order, you need to follow that order and you need to follow that instruction. And later on, after the dust has settled, talk it out and see what was going on and maybe get the full picture. At the same time, you may get, no, I need you to keep doing this because we, because of X, Y, Z, whatever it is. So, hey, Kaz, this has been quiet for the last 10 or 15 minutes. I'd really like to bring my squad back. No, I need you to hold that. This is absolutely critical. They can get back to that back line and cut off our logic at a moment's notice. And if we lose this road, this whole front dies. The whole operation is contingent on holding this road. I need you to hold this road. I know it's not exciting right now, but they're coming for you. Settle down and get ready for it, right? I've then explained my denial, and you can either continue to dissent or accept my rationale. I mean, you may not fully agree with it, but you at least have the explanation. Unless you can come up with something to persuade me of the other alternative, you know, you, you say, copy that, Kez, I, I get it, I understand this is important, but we've got vision extended all over these flanks, and if they come back here, I promise you I will have guys to take care of this threat by the time they get here. Still requesting that, can, may, or, or maybe I don't need all these guys. You know, Kez, I'll leave a rifle team of three guys here, but can I please send the other 75% of my squad to the front? I think we can make a difference there. Don't mean to push back, not trying to be ugly, but I think this is a mistake, right? Continue to push back, push back gently, push back respectfully, uh, but, but have the discussion. Right. You don't want to just go rogue. You need to advocate for what you feel is right, because at the end of the day, I'm going to bring this back to you. If I say no and you just take no for an answer and it's still wrong, you're still responsible because you didn't persuade me. And that seems like a real weird way to look at it. No, it's, it's your fault. You're you're the moron that's being an asshole, not listening to feedback. No. And, and you're, you you are 100 percent right. It is my fault. I shouldn't be an asshole. I shouldn't be uh, rigid and immovable. I shouldn't be uh, closed minded but it is still your responsibility to persuade me. If you're owning your situation and you're owning the outcomes, you own the responsibility of being persuasive enough 
to get around imperfect people. Because if you're going to look for an excuse at all times for why something didn't go right, you don't have to look far because you're going to find imperfections everywhere. If you want to take issue with the way that I lead and the way that I command, if you want to take issue with the orders I give, you don't have to look hard to find errors in that. That's the nature of working with people. You're going to find those everywhere. What you are, But what's going to happen is when you blame every outcome on other people's failings, you're going to fail to realize your own and you're going to fail to find improvement. Whereas if you had a better attitude about it and said, okay, Cass said no, maybe he doesn't have the full picture. I need to do a better job of explaining this. And then you do explain it and you get a better outcome. You just won. You saved, you saved me. You saved yourself. You saved your squad from a bad outcome because you took the ownership of the situation to realize that you probably have a little bit more power and influence than you think you do. And you and you were able to communicate that effectively to get a better outcome. So that's a very long answer to your question, Dart. Uh, but that's kind of what comes to mind from, from what you asked there. No, thank you. That's something that I, I do know that some um, members and young young leaders you know often get confo um get confused and quite often and, and this is kind of sad too because this is it's not tensional sometimes the the hard no with no follow-up kind of brushes off the wrong way but mm -hmm. it's all about you know don't ever if your leader or anyone else above you tells you just no and leaves it like that you know don't don't ever take it you know ill will out of it and even though it's it could sound harsh and just like you said you know you can be a little more persuasive i think you can still try don't outright just accept the no if unless you know it's like okay you know what all right i understand i'll i'll, I'll leave it maybe later it can be a, you know a good time yeah or like you said earlier you know try to convince hey okay well let me you know this is and explain your situation and if it's still a no you know, at, the, at that point, you know, don't let it manifest into a, you know, and this is where, you know, ego can really pl play bad into it that, you know what, okay, you don't understand me, fuck you then. Right. And that's the thing you don't want to, you know, create. And I'll say giving no is a bad answer. That's bad leadership. That that leader at that moment is failing you, but leader is going to fail you. I just, I just want to come back to that. You're going to operate in situations where people are not leading perfectly. Because that's that's life. That's people. We all lead imperfectly. We're studying this to try to become better, to try to become more consistent. But we're all going to break these rules from time to time. And it's having enough patience and kindness and gentleness with each other to to make sure that that doesn't bring the whole team down. And we work around each other's weaknesses. When I am weak, you are strong and vice versa. If we can look out for each other instead of finding those gotcha moments when we fail and falter, that, that's what it's about. Uh, absolutely. So... Uh, the, you know, I, with that, no, one thing that I think I've probably heard most commonly with that is, you know, if, if, I, if I'm a squad lead in Razor's LC in that day, and I say, hey, Razor, I, I got this idea. And he goes, not right now, Kaz. I, now, that's very abrupt. But I know what's going on. He's got a situation that's developed, and he's micromanaging some resources. he got somebody else in his ear. I know exactly what's going on there. That's cool. I'll wait 60 seconds. I'll try him again. Hey, Razor, you got a second? Yeah, Kaz, go ahead, right? And then we'll, then we'll go through it, right? And so that, that usually, most commonly, you get a you get a like a firm, brief no because that person doesn't have time. Like that person's probably in a storm. They don't have the mental energy to hear what you're trying to put down. <laughs> they're they're too overwhelmed with something else to even be able to consider it. Thank you. All right, let's so, go to the next. I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, no, it's it's good. So let's talk about the importance of good orders here for a minute. So orders that are too specific stifle innovation and issue. We've already talked about that. Orders that are too broad create opportunities for chaos and disjointed efforts. So like in most things in life, you got to find balance. You have to be specific enough that your resources are coordinated, but broad enough that those resources can react, can maneuver, and ultimately win on that battlefield. And so I like to look at poor orders, push and take baths. That's a little too broad, and I'll explain why in a minute. Attack to drown veil is obviously very broad. A lot of people can interpret that in very different ways. Stop screwing around is a bad order. You, you need to redirect that. Instead of saying stop screwing around, hey, listen, man, I really need you over here working on this uh, on this here. I need you on the left side of the squad covering our flank. I need you working with this fire team, uh, what, whatever it is. But just simply saying stop a behavior without redirecting it is not, is not a good order. Uh, and then this re really nice overly specific one, take three guys, hold F-13, keep pad six, have them take four rifle, uh, take rifles, four mags of ammo, a hammer, and 20 BMATs each. Again, a little, uh, a little, little too specific. Instead, hey, I need you to lo look at our southern flank, see if what you can do about getting me some vision down here, making sure we don't get flanked over there. Done. 
Give them the initiative to figure out the solution. Maybe they need to take 20 B mats and build watchtowers down there. Maybe they just need to patrol it in a Jeep. Maybe they drive back and forth with a Jeep and QRF that area. Uh, whatever it is, leave that to the squad leader. So I'll very commonly, instead of just giving a specific directive, I'll have a squad that I know is going to do QRF for the day. I'll say, Tempestus, I got a vulnerability on the southern flank. See what you can do about that for me. Done. I don't know what he's going to do about it, but I know he's going to take care of it. Maybe he's going to build watchtowers. Maybe he's going to sign his whole squad to deal with it because that's what's needed. But I've given him the freedom and flexibility. All I care about is that the job is done. I don't care about how he gets the job done. I just want to make sure the job is done. And similarly, if I put too much on him and I've got him QRFing three different spots, if he's taking professional initiative as a leader, he's going to tell me, Kaz, I need, I need some more guys to be able to hold all these angles. I get pressure from the south, the northwest, and the east. I don't have enough manpower to get this objective done. Copy that. I'll get you another half track. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll, I'll mechanize, pull back a half track, and give you some fire support that way. That'll get it done. Thank you. Right? That's where that communication goes back and forth. But again, I've given him enough freedom to make that call. And so I've already moved in to some good order sets. I'm going to give some very specific examples here um, of a better order set. So instead of attacking Drown Vale, instead of you know take baths, I want us to advance down the main road to boot nap. I need the CEs to build me a bunker bases about every 100 meters. Make sure that we've got a, a fighting position secured. I need Reductus to equip direct, indirect fire support and focus on destroying enemy defenses on the road to boot now. I need Scars as the primary infantry vanguard for the main assault. I need you to remain flexible and make sure that you're choosing the best angle assault. Let me know what you see as you're moving up the road. I need Tempestus to QRF for flanks and, and, and for Lodgy. Assist CE in building watchtowers and securing our position. Report back when you feel confident in our position, and then I'm going to reposition you to help us on the main line of attack. You know, whatever it is, right? And then finally, Lodgy, I need you to have a series of light fob kits ready because we're going to be building multiple bunker bases on the line of advance, and I want each of those bunker bases to have a light supply kit so that our infantry have the freedom to choose different spawns as we advance this line. And so this this gives kind of that overall plan of we're going to take boot nap, and it decentralizes that into a series of different order sets to these companies. And within that those order sets, these companies have initiative to figure out what's best. Lodgy, I've given them that I want about, when I say I need about 100 shirts, they know that, okay, I need enough infantry supplies to support that. And we'll give, a, you know, we'll give a sprinkling of the stuff that we need based on what's been going on in the other side of the, uh, based on uh, what, what's what been communicated in the battle. With with Tempestas, I've already talked about the QRF example. I won't go into it. With Scars, again, they're, they've got binos on the front. SAR is up there and he's able to look around and say, hey, hey Kaz, I'm looking, I'm here on the road. The north side of this town is absolute hell, but I've taken a look, and the south side's looking pretty juicy. If we move around on the flank here, we bring some mechanized resources, I think we can break this town from the south. Awesome. Appreciate you giving me that heads out. Because what SAR's going to see that before I do as LC. Because SAR has the initiative and the freedom. I've told him to scout that. He's going to get me that information 20 minutes sooner than what I had it myself, because I'm busy doing this, I'm busy doing that, and before I can get to the front with my own binos to see what's going on, we'll have wasted 20 minutes busting our head against the hardest part of that wall. Instead, I've given... I've delegated that piece properly, and SAR has the freedom to take proper initiative in assessing that situation and helping us make better choices. With Reductus, we've already given examples about how to use indirect fire and take initiative with indirect fire, and so I won't go through that again. And then once again with CEs. I've given them the, the rough guideline that I want bunker bases every 100 meters, and those guys know exactly what to do that. They know what saturation of defenses to place. They know what the terrain offers, and they're going to go and get it done. And, and, and I know that they're going to give me the appropriate amount of vision for that to make that happen. They'll make it wide or shallow depending on the terrain. I don't have to tell them how to do their job. They know what I'm looking for based on the general, based on the high level version of this order. And so these are some sample order sets that leave room for people to take initiative. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about initiative here in a minute. But initiative is only possible in spaces where the orders are sufficiently uh, are sufficiently broad for people to do so. Remember, don't go too broad. If you go too broad, people will take initiative in really, really strange ways. And you won't have decide. You won't have a coordination of resources. And I would argue that we've probably leaned a little too heavily into orders that are overly broad. And I think some of our infantry squad leaders will probably empathize with this. That we have at times had situations where our front has not gone well, or it has gone stale, and we've got three infantry sections that are disjointed due to the freedom that they have. And so their only order is. I obviously operate around or spawn. And so they're all taking initiative to do what they think is best, but they're taking initiative uh, in ways that are not in harmony with one another. And so one squad might be working in the middle. Another squad might be going around and trying to cut Lodgy. Another squad may be moving the right flank. Whereas if we instead decided, okay, the best angle of attack for us is to really hit this front hard. 
You, Reductus, you're on the left flank. Scars, your center. Tempestus, your right. Regroup on you know, regroup here in five minutes on your rallies points, and we're going to hit this hard from these three different angles of attack. That level of concerted uh, energy can be helpful to bring coordination back. And then those squad leaders have a little bit more focus in order. And that focus is not bad. Reductus still has a lot of freedom. Even if I know, even if I know that I'm attacking the left flank, I still have a great degree of latitude in how I attack that flank. What resources I choose to bring, how centralized or decentralized my squad is, whether I'm going to fortify positions up and try to ahead, whether I'm going to take anti-tank resources or what kind of resources I'm going to bring. I've got a lot of flexibility in how I do that. Uh, but I know that I've got, I've got to kill colleagues in that zone to help the team. And that, and that sometimes that's the level of specificity that may be required. Uh, so again, that's a long monologue. Once again, dark, any, any thoughts that come to mind as you're looking at this and considering this? No, uh, no, I think you're, right now you're, you're really well explaining, explaining it and gaining it on. I don't really think I got much to offer for at least this, uh, right on for this particular slide. So let's go through some initiative examples then. Uh, so you've gotten your order set. And let's say that uh, your order set, I'm going to give two, uh, two order sets here as an example and give some examples of good and bad initiative within this state. Uh, your mission is QRF and defend our lodge route. Stealing a battle tank from the enemy backline at that point is not good initiative. That's a flashy play, but it's not taking good initiative. And I, this will resonate with some, some of the infantry leaders because we have certain guys in our squads that take a lot of initiative to do some really weird things that are not consistent with the objective that they're given. And it's really hard to talk about that play and say that that's a bad play. We just got a battle tank. That's awesome, right? But it's not a good play. Like, at the end of the day, that person won and they achieved a really cool victory, but they achieved a cool victory with bad technique. And, and so, as a result, we won that time, but nine times in ten, we lose because I've got a guy that's gone rogue on me, and you don't see how many times that he died trying to pull off that flank to seal that battle tank for no redemptive purpose. And I'm down a guy in my squad nine times in ten, Whereas one in ten, I just got a free battle tank, and some of you may think that's that's a that's pretty good, uh, but but in truth, it's not that good, and it's 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 a bad habit, and it is a bad play that looks good because it had a good outcome, and so you really need to think about these things when you are doing activities and you're doing actions. Are you accomplishing the mission, or are you accomplishing your own mission? Because your own mission may not do a whole heck of a lot for us to further our primary objectives. And our primary objectives are what are what matter. So if we're going to need to QRF and defend our Elijah route, and we get a tank in exchange for our Elijah route, we still lose that battle because we ran out of shirts on the front. And so, th as I mentioned before, I'll mention again, there's an opportunity cost for anything. When you choose an action, you exchange one thing for another. Uh, <laughs> I get you, sorry. And, and there's some, some very high-profile guys in DK that can do some miracle work. Carson's a great example of a guy that can pull rabbits out of a hat. But pulling a rabbit out of a hat during an operation when he's got a specific task isn't necessarily great gameplay. Uh, he, and I don't want to take anything away from Carson. Carson is amazing. Bjorn is amazing. Uh, th these are two guys that immediately come to mind as, 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 as commandos that can pull off some really nutty stuff. But And I want that in certain contexts. And maybe, you know what, maybe I as a leader need to take advantage of their strengths and not put them in a position where they're going to fail. Maybe instead of having them go rogue on me, I say, Carson, Bjorn, I want you guys to do what you do best. And I think that if we have you guys go commando and, and give you guys the support you need to steal a tank, maybe instead of stealing that tank one time in 10, they steal that tank three time in 10, and that becomes a strategic objective that furthers our mission instead of something that's done on the side that we can't support. So as a leader, how are you using those talents? How are you using the resources of your guys that are exceptionally strong in certain spaces and building plans and building your uh, battle plan around it? And sometimes you don't have the need for a commando. You need the, as many riflemen as possible to win that front, and that's what's important you got to choose the opportunity cost that you're going to take. Uh, and so keep that in mind as a leader because those opportunity costs are indeed limitless and you are very commonly going to make the wrong decision. As a leader, as an LC, I'm going to make the wrong decision about opportunity costs. But a good example of taking initiative on this very simple mission, mission, QRF and Defender Lodge Route, good initiative, constructing watchtowers along that road, requesting a vehicle to assist in patrolling the route, communicating that no enemies are spotted for the last 15 minutes and requesting reassignment or even suggesting a new responsibility. But taking initiative to get that job done, maybe taking initiative to split off a small team to handle that responsibility while you're doing other activities. You know, there, there are things that you can do to innovate in that, but you were able to innovate in that and get the job done because the mission was specific enough that you accomplished something, but broad enough that you could take initiative. Mission, provide infantry support for our armor as it advances down the road. 
a, a poor example of initiative is performing a wide flank on the enemy position to cut their logistics and ambush enemy squads in the midfield. That's not covering your armor. That's not helping your armor out. And now our armor is a vulnerable sticky rusher. So yeah, you cut their logi route and you may have gotten a truck. Maybe you got a truck that was filled with shirts and explosives. That's awesome. But I just lost a tank because they didn't have infantry support. That opportunity cost isn't great. And maybe we need to cut that logi road, but maybe somebody else should do that. Maybe we need to have a plan around that. Maybe we should be making a better decision about how we allocate our resources here. A good example is equipping close range equipment to engage sticky runners. Maybe it's adding beam mats and hammers to your standard kit. Maybe it's equipping additional AT resources so that when we get in an armored engagement, we're in a better position to win that because we've got infantry adding an extra layer of initiative, an extra layer of firepower to that armored engagement so we win that armor engagement. You were given this mission to make sure we win the armor fight, so do tasks that will help achieve that. Uh, so, uh, so, so be careful about what initiative you take in that space. Make sure the initiative you take ultimately achieves the mission. So when you're taking initiative, you should be asking the question is, are the activities that I'm selecting helping me achieve my mission, helping me achieve the assignment, or do I have this really great idea that I think is good? Maybe I need to get a change of mission. And so instead, you know, maybe, so we'll take this example again. I get, I got this idea for a great flank. I see a vulnerability where we can cut their large lines, do some damage, copy that. Scarus, go ahead and break off and do that mission. Uh, Tempestus, I need you to provide infantry support for our armor so it, as it advances down the road. We still cover down on this very critical responsibility, and you can still do what you want if you can persuade the Legion commander or you can persuade your squad leaders around you to make sure that we're still covering down on the core mission. Uh, there's room for persuasion. There's room for changes in orders, but you got to coordinate. you got to communicate, and don't leave your team hanging like that. Uh, it, 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 uh, I've seen really, really weird situations where Infantry leaders have taken initiative in spaces and made good plays, but sacrificed their core mission for that play. Uh, and that that's a loss. That's a net loss at the end of the day. Um, so we are coming up just at the one hour mark for this, and we have made it just sliding into home base for the question section here. So, so Dart, oh, finally. We, 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 we landed almost right on the dot. Uh, perfectly. So I, I do want to open up to questions for anybody in chat that has anything that they want to bring up, uh, anything that they would like to ask. So we'll, we'll, we'll stay on for a few more minutes for anybody that would like to do that. Uh, but this is kind of the introduction to delegation and initiative, things that you should be thinking about. I know that this cast was significantly focused on squad leadership and we've not spent as much time talking about, you know, as a lineman. So like you're a line infantry guy or you're a member of a squad you know, how do you take initiative in that envir environment? And the brief answer to that is the rules of engagement don't change, the scope changes, right? And so you can still take an initiative as a member of a team, and you can still e sometimes even delegate as a member of a team if you've got the right rapport with your peers and the people around you. You can step up and be an informal leader in the right environment. You have to be cautious about how you do that so that you don't come off as uh, author you know, having authority that you don't have, but there's nothing preventing you from saying, you know, uh, of, of walking in a squad, you've got an assignment and saying, okay, uh, Bjorn, if, if you'll hold the left, I'll hold the right flank here. You kind of negotiate that with your team instead of ordering your team or delegating your team. You can kind of get small little periods of initiative and delegation, even as a rifle team member, by seeing opportunities and, and, and leading informally in that space. So don't, don't be afraid to do that. Um, that's something uh, I just ahead. want to chime in that uh, squad leaders also see, you know, because it's, it's a good subtle way to show like, you know what, this guy's taking initiative to, you know, communicate with his, with his, you know, with the squad mates. Then later on, you know, that, that that's a good way to build good habits that can ultimately, you know, trigger uh, squad leaders to help develop you as a leader. Yeah. And it's like key things like that, you know, you got to strive for. There, there, are, there are a couple of things that really, just for those of you that aren't in leadership or concerning, or, or in, are considering leadership or want to grow as leaders and aren't in that position, there are a few things that, that kind of show a lot, uh, that, that demonstrate leadership potential. And you don't want to go too hard into these, but, but one of the first ones is showing that you know how to listen. And that's most important. Like to lead, you got to know how to follow first uh, and demonstrating that you know how to follow other people is, is probably the most critical thing that you can do. And, and it's one of the things that I, I was very meticulous about when I was a line infantry guy. And I got recognized that I was really, really manic about making sure I was on point with whatever the squad leader order. I, I followed those orders to a fault at the time because I was learning the game. And there were things that maybe I suspected wasn't good, but I, I trusted 
and, and many, you know, 75% of the time, that person was right and I was wrong. Even though my gut told me it was a bad play or a bad idea, I still trusted, I followed, I learned and grew in that space. And, and by showing that I was a good follower, uh, it showed that I at least had the base level potential to lead. On the flip side of things, showing the ability to communicate and coordinate is the next thing. So taking, as Dark said, taking that initiative to, to find opportunities to coordinate and collaborate with other people in a way that's, uh, that's not authoritarian. <laughs> that's a kind of a weird thing, but I've seen, you know, some new guys that come into DK on occasion that have previous leadership experience sometimes go very awry because, uh, they come in hard and they come in heavy and they've got all these ideas. They've played mill sims for years. Maybe they've been in the military in the past. Maybe they're a leader in, uh, in their professional life and they just come on strong and expect people to follow them because they know what they're doing, quote unquote. And people generally speaking, don't respond well to that. And so having a humble approach, having a, 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 uh, a collaborative approach saying, Hey, listen, I think that there's an opportunity for to do this over here. What do you guys think? Or, you know, those kind of things, making suggestions instead of orders, I guess is the best way I can put it. Making suggestions, making recommendations instead of firmly ordering people or firm making bold claims like this is the right play. We should do this or, and coming on real strong can be a, a good way for people to notice that you've got some leadership potential and that you know how to mess with people. Uh, and, and cowboy, I mean, that's actually a, pretty succinct way to mention too many people talk at people and not to them. And there's a whole, there's a whole additional topic around, you know, having constructive conversations. And, you know, we actually, again, we had, we actually had a whole podcast dedicated, dedicated to constructive criticism. And that hits it right on the nail cowboy is giving constructive feedback is talking to people, talking with people and not talking at them. I think that's a great way to put that. Um, so we've had the questions open for a few minutes at this point, and I don't see any forthcoming. So we're going to start moving into closing here, unless anybody skates in here at the last hour. Uh, Dark, any closing thoughts for tonight? No, nothing. I'm just just excited for this more. Uh, these these aspiring topics for the next couple of uh, streams are, you know, they're, they're a little more foxhole focused, but still, you know, tie home to like, you know, again, these teachings can help you in your daily day life and whatever is whatever aspirations you wish to do but i'm excited just you know cause we, we can actually use the foxhole a lot more naturally with these topics yeah and, uh, yeah should be good yeah i think that's the goal uh I th you know we've, we have gotten some uh early feedback that you know in some of the previous casts we might have been we may have leaned a little bit too heavy in the professional examples over the foxhole once so we've tried to re lean back the other direction a little bit and so one of the things that you can expect for future casts here that we're considering is getting more into raw tactics. And so if you've got strong feelings about that, either affirmatively or negatively, we'd love to hear from you on that. We do have a sub-series of this planned out to do a combined arm segment that really goes deep and dirty into like the high-level tactics of using infantry, artillery, mechanized, logistics resources, CE resources. How do they fit in the bigger picture and what things you should be thinking about? Kind of from like a Legion command perspective, if you're running an op with 60 people, where do those pieces fit? How do you use them? Where are they strong? Where are they weak? And so that's a, se that's a segment that we are planning. We will continue with these leadership uh, nuggets because uh, there's a lot, there's still so much to go through and so much to learn. Uh, but keep the questions coming. Keep the topics coming. If you've got a space that you really want to learn about, I have no problems dedicating a session to a good question. So so please keep them coming in our Discord. You can hit us up in our Discord in the no man's, hashtag no man's land, and we'd be more than happy to uh, to respond to that and consider it. So with all that being said, I appreciate you guys giving us your time tonight. I hope that this was beneficial to you and that you're able to grow. As Dark mentioned, our goal is for you to grow as a Foxhole player and as a leader, but definitely grow in your life to, you know, to apply these principles of humility, of patience and kindness and gentleness, because that's what the fundamentals that make all these things happen. Apply those to your life and you'll see a lot of things happen for you in good ways. And so with all that being said, we're going to go ahead and say have a good night and we'll shut down the stream from there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hey, later, guys.